Rest while you can, legs. Rest while you can. What is on your mind? I used to. Not so much now. When I was a child, it became clear that my unusual appearance would make my life a little harder. But these days, it usually does not bother me. We are all odd in one way or another. I say embrace it. Well, that says a lot more about you and our friendship than it does about the color of my fur. Those who I am close to only tend to see me. Fergus had trouble understanding why others viewed me as an oddity. He used to say, Your coloring is not fatal. It does not affect who you are. Give it no thought. An understandable but naive opinion. As I am sure you know, how someone appears can largely determine how they are treated by other people. A physically beautiful person usually lives in a world with a great many courtesies and smiles. On the other hand, a seemingly unusual individual often exists in a realm of awkward glances, disdain, and sometimes open hostility. I gain nothing from ignoring this fact. Whenever I notice a negative reaction, I try to bear my uniqueness in mind. Ignorance is regrettable, but it is not a crime. Anyway, I am at peace with my appearance now. I have grown into it. I no longer dwell on what makes me different, but I am aware that I am. I am glad it is so. I like you just the way you are. I suppose we are all strange to someone, my friend. Unfortunately, certain people will always distrust what they do not understand. My coloring does not define who I am to me. That is what is important, I think. <laughs> okay, dragon lover, whatever you say. What do you wish to discuss? That is quite a lengthy tale. Are you sure you want to hear it? It happened not long after I got my scars. I stopped off in Windhelm on my way to Riften. I arrived weary, bloody, and fragrant. All I wanted was a hot meal and a room for the night, but it was not to be. As soon as I entered the city, I felt the weight of distrustful eyes upon me. I was too tired to care. I made my way to Candleheart Hall and tried to purchase a room. I was told in no uncertain terms that I was not welcome and that I should seek shelter elsewhere. While I was explaining that I had gold and would cause no trouble, I noticed three brawny men watching me with interest. I turned from the innkeep and faced the men. You fellows see something strange? I asked. No, friend, replied the nearest. We see a man who needs a bed and a bath, but we fear you won't find them here. If you have coin, maybe we can help you. I was not sure I trusted them either, but at that moment, I decided to give them the benefit of the doubt. Anyway, I told the men I would happily part with a few coins for a room. They said they were brothers and for 15 septims, I would be a guest in their home that night. They told me that their mother would be happy to set another place at their table. I did not have many options, so I agreed. The 
man took me to a deserted alleyway and motioned for me to stop. The youngest brother turned to me and said, before we continue, we must have your word that you will keep what we are about to show you to yourself. No problem, I replied. He nodded, then felt along the stone wall, paused, then knocked four times. There was a grinding noise, and a large section slid back to reveal a torch-lit passageway. Who are you people? I asked as we entered the gap in the wall. Do not be alarmed, said the eldest brother. Hot food and a warm bed are waiting up ahead. We pressed on, and the entrance closed behind us. It was relatively warm. Water dripped from the stony ceiling, and I could smell magic in the air. We soon came to a heavy wooden door. The youngest brother stepped forward and again knocked four times. I heard a key turn on the other side, a grunt, the door opened, and I was face to face with the oldest woman I have ever seen. We have a guest, dear mother, said the eldest brother. Well, come in then, table set, go wash your hands. You weren't followed, were you? No, no, he replied, pushing past her. Come in, friend. You're safe, and soon you'll be fed. I stepped inside. I was in a huge stone room full of all manner of useless junk and trinkets. There were no windows, and it was very dim, but I could make out a row of beds against the far wall near a large open fire. The old woman looked up at me. Got money? She held out a gnarled hand. Of course, I said, handing it over. Thank you for letting me rest here. What is your name? Everyone just calls me mother, she said. You can do the same if you like. Makes no difference to me. She motioned for me to sit at a long table where the other men were already eating greedily. I sat and tucked in. There was soup and roast beef and vegetables, and I ate until I thought I was going to rupture. When we were done, I was taken to a corner sectioned off by hanging furs. Inside, there was a steaming bath. I sank into it, felt my poor muscles relax and shut my eyes. I drifted off. I had some very strange dreams. I saw the brothers caper and dance and fly about the room. I saw Fergus in a pool of blood staring up at me, mouthing the words, Run, Inigo! Run! I saw a vast glass cage with a rough and scored ceiling. I saw many things I have now forgotten. When I awoke, the room was spinning and bleary. I heard the deep, muffled voices. Then I saw what was next to me, and my heart froze. <laughs> yes, but he was not as you know him now. At least he did not appear that way to me. Anyway. What I saw was the king of dragonflies, the largest dragonfly imaginable. He was in a massive jar to my left and he was spinning about in a frenzy. That is when I realized I was in a jar of my own. I tried to call out for help but no words came. I looked down at my hands and saw that they were missing. I now seemed to have pincers. I leapt to my feet in horror and bounced off the inside of the jar. Suddenly, I realized I was flying. I buzzed about for a bit, trying to get used to my new wings. After a while, I had things under control. I realized that the handsome dragonfly in the jar next to mine was not so large after all. 
I had been made small, like him. I also saw that we were not alone. A number of other jars were in a row to my left, each holding an insect. There were butterflies and glow bugs and moths too. My vision was blurred by the jar, but I could still make out four enormous figures at the far end of the now seemingly cavernous room. One of them pointed in my direction and laughed. The sound was booming and very scary. The individual approached and I saw it was Mother. I heard a noise from my right, looked over, and saw that my dragonfly neighbor had fallen down dead with fright. I thought he was a dead dragonfly. I was quite flustered, as you can imagine. Mother came right up to my jar and tapped an enormous grubby finger against the glass. Her toothless grin filled my view. She then picked up the dragonfly's jar, shook it, scowled, and slammed it back down. She grabbed another jar, this time from my left, removed the lid and plucked out the moth inside. It feebly flapped between her fingers. She held it up to my jar, then forced the poor creature into her mouth. I heard the body crunch between her gums. That is when I heard a voice inside my head. It was well-spoken and calm. It was the voice of a scholar giving a lesson to a dim child. It said, pay attention. Go still and she will not eat you. Mother swallowed the moth and picked up my jar again. I let myself go limp and lay motionless. I seemed to be missing my eyelids, so I was forced to watch as she first uncapped my jar then reached inside. Her gigantic hand paused before it reached me, then withdrew. Stay still, said the voice in my head. It was hard, but I managed. Mother held my jar up and studied me. She shook me, then studied me again. Passed out, she said with a voice like an avalanche. Scared him senseless. She put my jar down and turned away. You'll have to get me more. I need to eat tonight. Another huge figure came into view. It was the eldest brother. Mother, he said. Why do you have to frighten them so? Because they taste better squirming and fearful. You know that. Her son sighed, woke his brothers, and left. Mother turned and made for her bed. That is when I heard the dragonfly yell in my head. Your jar! Hit the wall of your jar! Mother had placed me on the shelf with the base of my jar hanging over the edge. I leapt towards the glass, flapping my wings as fast as I could. I bounced back then hit it again and again. My jar toppled off the shelf and smashed on the stone floor. Yes, cried the dragonfly. Lay still, she's coming back. So there I lay, surrounded by shattered glass, as mother approached us a second time. I thought she was going to step on me, but instead she cursed and knelt down. I heard her joints creak. I'll have to get you a new jar, or I could just eat you now. Not tasty, but tempting. I wanted to flap my wings. I wanted to fly and hide, but I did not. She picked me up. Her grimy face filled my view. She smiled and licked her lips. She opened her mouth.
As her mouth drew nearer, I started to flap my wings. I could not help it. I wanted to escape. Alas, she was too strong and I was too small. Suddenly there was a bonk noise and mother's jaw went slack. Her muddy eyes rolled back and she collapsed. I struggled out from under her hand and saw the dragonfly's jar rolling to a stop near a chair leg. You knocked her out, I yelled in my mind. Yes, he replied. I managed to tip my jar onto her head. Thank you, I said. What is your name? He said, I cannot remember. I have been a dragonfly too long, but there is hope for you. He directed me to a nearby alchemy table and told me to nibble a bit of this and that. He had the antidote memorized. I followed his instructions and soon I felt the worst pins and needles I have ever endured. I passed out and when I awoke, I was me again. I rushed over to the dragonfly and opened his jar, but he refused to fly out. I heard his voice in my head, but it was weaker, distant somehow. It is too late for me, he said. The antidote cannot fix me. I am more dragonfly than man now. Please, reseal my jar. It brings me comfort. His fall to the floor was interrupted by the witch's head. Mine was not. Also, his jar is far sturdier than any other I have seen. I have often wondered if it is enchanted. Anyway, I did as I was asked, then placed him on a chair while I retrieved my clothes. I then went to the long table where I had eaten. The soup, said the insect I would later come to think of as Mr. Dragonfly. I turned and smiled at him. We were having the same idea. I carried the soup pot to where mother lay, opened her mouth and splashed some inside. It will take time. Free the others and leave, said Mr. Dragonfly. Why can I only hear you inside my head, I asked. He told me that the other insects had been there far longer than him and they had forgotten how to communicate with words long ago. I listened closely to a nearby butterfly. I could hear a faint weeping inside my head, nothing more. Not just bugs, other animals too. Usually I do not hear very much that is understandable, but sometimes I get lucky. Mr. Dragonfly is the most eloquent by far. Anyway, I opened all the jars then turned to leave and saw a fat moth with grey wings lumbering out of a pile of dirty clothes where mother had been. I scooped her up, sealed her in a jar, then hid her at the back of an ingredients cupboard. I could hear her hissing at me in my mind. I turned to Mr. Dragonfly. Do you want to come with me? I asked. Yes, please, he replied. Let us go. I grabbed his jar, unlocked the door and opened it. I found myself face to face with the brothers. Yes, their mouths fell open, their eyebrows went up, and the youngest let out a little whimper. I drew my sword and ran at them. They were so surprised to see me, it took a moment for them to realize I was going for the exit, not them. They shrank back as I rushed past, and soon I had reached the hidden door that led out to the city. I pulled a rusty wall chain, and the opening appeared. But before I could get outside, the eldest brother jumped on my back and tore open my scars. I shook him off, making sure not to drop Mr. Dragonfly, then stumbled out into Windhelm. I lost my footing and went to the ground. 
Roll, cried Mr. Dragonfly inside my mind. I did, and a mace came down, smashing a flagstone next to my head. The brothers had followed me outside. They each had a weapon, and it was clear they wanted me dead. I regained my feet and brandished my sword at them. Back, I yelled. I will let you live if you walk away. Mother wouldn't turn you back, said the middle brother. What did you do to her? I cured her of her ugliness and put her somewhere safe, I replied. Townsfolk stopped to see what was happening. We were attracting a crowd. I turned to the onlookers and said, These men held me against my will. Call the guard. My words were met with stony avidity. Then someone threw a bottle at me. The eldest brother shouted, This filthy Khajiit broke into our home. He was looking for skooma money, no doubt. The crowd was getting nasty, and as another bottle smashed near my feet, I saw two guards at the back of the group turn and walk away. Run, said Mr. Dragonfly inside my head. He did not have to tell me twice. The youngest brother took a swipe at me with his sword. I leapt back, overturned the cart of cabbages, and fled. I sped past the graveyard into the marketplace and glanced behind me. I had lost most of the crowd, but the brothers were still on my tail. I rushed through the main gate, out onto the bridge. I was exhausted, but while my legs had been running, Mr. Dragonfly's mind had come up with a plan. As the brother stepped out of the gate, panting and furious, I walked out onto the ledge to the left before the first stone arch. I sheathed my sword and held out Mr. Dragonfly's jar. Do you know who this is? I shouted. I don't care, all those bugs look the same to me, replied the middle brother. Stay there, you coward. You're a dead man. I waited until all three brothers stood near me at the edge. Do you love your mother? I asked. Yes, sniffed the youngest. Tell us where she is and we'll kill you quickly, said the eldest. Here, I replied. Then I threw Mr. Dragonfly off the bridge. The brothers all yelled, No! and threw themselves over the edge, trying in vain to catch the jar. If I had carried out the plan 30 feet along the wall, they may have survived, but the icy water they landed in was very shallow. There was quite a mess. For a second, I was worried about Mr. Dragonfly, but then I spotted his jar bobbing in the bloody water. I made my way down to the river and retrieved him. He thanked me, and I asked him again if he wouldn't rather be released. No, he said. I will stay in my jar and in your company if that is okay. I have already forgotten my past life, and even the meanings of these words I am saying are beginning to fade. I told him he could stay with me for as long as he wished, then asked what I should call him. Mother scratched my initials on the lid of my jar, he said. I no longer know what they mean. They seem to say Mr. D, I replied. Do you mind if I call you Mr. Dragonfly? He said that was fine. He then said that I would no doubt lose the ability to hear him soon, but so far that has not been the case. Ever since my transformation, I have been able to randomly pick up his thoughts. I can also sometimes understand horses, fleas, and dogs too. Their thoughts are alien and often do not contain words as we know them, but I can usually decipher the overall gist. Mr. Dragonfly's fear about losing his words has also not come to pass. I think our little conversations are good for his mind. Anyway, that is how Mr. Dragonfly and I met. It was a long story. I hope I did not bore you. I am glad you enjoyed it. Telling it was easier than living it, my friend.
All things considered, I am doing well. How is everything with you? I am sorry to hear that. Do you want to talk about it? I do not know what the future holds, but I believe in your ability. If anyone can succeed, it is you. Ifs, buts, and maybes, my friend. They often kill success before it has had a chance. Fail or win, none of your doubts will matter in the long run. All you can do is try. As long as you do that, there is hope. 